Our first reading this morning is from Acts chapter 3, starting at verse 11. While the lame man, who was now healed, clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them on the portico called Solomon's Astounded. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety that we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers, but what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, and thus he fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn again that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Here ends the first reading. Christ has risen from the dead. God the Father has crowned him with glory and honor. He has given him dominion over the works of his hands. He has put all things under his feet. And the epistle reading this morning is from 1 John chapter 3, starting at the first verse. See what kind of love the Father has given to us? that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning, and no one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, do not let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Here ends the epistle reading. Alleluia. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Alleluia. Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory be to thee. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Then he said to them, 
These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer, and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is, he is risen indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia. Jesus said to his disciples, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. Your friends in Christ, when was the last time that you went into an art gallery or an art museum? When was the last place that you went somewhere? I know that we, uh, for the past year at least, haven't been doing a lot of things out in public that we used to do. Uh, but when was the last time that you went and walked through and just looked at pieces of fine art? You know, when we lived in St. Louis, um, there were several things uh, that were there in a place called Forest Park. Uh, and the zoo was one of them, the St. Louis Zoo, which I believe at the time was completely free. It was Paid for through donations. It was paid for, I guess, through taxes and things like that. I don't know. But you could walk through the zoo for free. But then they also had the St. Louis Fine Art Museum. And it was free. You got to walk through that place and you got to see paintings by some of the most famous artists that you could probably even think of. I mean, they had Rembrandts. They had Monet's. They had Picasso's. It was incredible. You know, walking through an art gallery uh, can be a, a, an awesome experience, but I tell you what, it can be an even more awesome experience when you actually know what you're looking for. Imagine two people walking through an art gallery. The, the one has never been through an art gallery before, maybe has never uh, taken an art class, if you can imagine that. I think we all took art in school, right? One of the things that I remember from taking art classes in school was the idea of art appreciation. The fact that when you look at a painting or even a sculpture, you actually read the painting. You actually look at the places where there are light and where there is dark. You look at the brush strokes, if it has brush strokes that are visible. You look at the composition of where certain things are because nothing shows up in a painting by accident. Everything is there for a purpose. So imagine these two people, right? The one who just walks in and says, well, that's a pretty picture. I like that one. And the other who looks and who understands and who pays attention to where the eyes of the subjects in the painting are pointing. And, and that, that figure that's off in the back, off in the, the deep parts of the room where his eyes are pointing. They see the, the details of something that's spilled on the, on the floor, and they, they wonder, what is the story behind that? What is the story that this piece of artwork is telling us? Now, I bring that up for us today because I think that as Christians, I think that it is important for us to read the artwork that is in the Scriptures. Because today and, well, last week, if you were with us, we have a very similar image, do we not? John chapter 20 and then Luke 24 verses 36 and following. Well, we have Jesus again with the disciples, again in the upper room, again saying, peace be with you. Only in John's gospel, we have a few different details. The notable absence of Thomas called Didymus. The fact that, that Jesus sends the disciples out, that he breathes on them and gives them his Holy Spirit to go and to forgive sins in his name. Contrast that with the, the picture that, that is before us this day of Jesus standing there 
While the disciples are marveling at the two men who had come and said that they met Jesus on the road towards Emmaus, and Jesus walked on with them, and then they, they went into a, 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 a house, and they sat down to eat, and when Jesus broke the bread, he had already explained to them, he had opened their hearts to the scriptures, but when he broke the bread, they knew him in the breaking of the bread. And immediately Jesus vanished from before them. They come running back those seven, those eight miles back to Jerusalem and find the disciples. And that's where we find ourselves tonight. These two breathless young men saying, we have seen the Lord. The disciples are terrified. Because anyone that can just up and vanish must be a spirit, must be a ghost. But then Jesus himself stands there among them. Jesus himself, in the portrait, front and center, Jesus himself, pointing to his hands and to his feet. Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And, and that verse... That verse must be the focus of our, our talk, our, our sermon today, because Jesus says so. He says, see my hands and my feet that it is I myself. You know, I remember one time uh, in an art class that I was taking in high school, we were looking uh, through the, uh, the art textbook, and there was this small square picture, right? And it was a detail of a painting called Water Lilies uh, by Monet. If you know the painting, you know perhaps the one that I'm talking about. It just looks like, you know, the little lily pads that a frog would jump on in a cartoon, right? But this little detail of it just shows one lily pad with, with a little flower on it. That's the detail of it. When you actually see the painting itself, it is huge. It takes up half of the wall here. It is an uh, entire pond covered in lilies. It is It is beautiful. But just the little detail, it shows you the style of Monet. It shows you exactly what, uh, well, the authors of the textbook wanted you to appreciate about that art, about the, the brush strokes and everything else. Jesus invites us to see not everything, just not yet, but first to see his hands and his feet. Jesus says, see that it is I myself. This introduces a beautiful theme that we do well as Christians to take to heart. And that is the fact that from the time that Jesus goes to the cross on Good Friday, he is and will always be known as the crucified one. The marks of his crucifixion go with him into the resurrection. So much so that even in the book of Revelation, when John has those visions of the heavenly throne room of God and he sees the Lamb, Seated on the throne. What does he say over and over again? A lamb looking as if it had been slain. That's Jesus. Jesus is the crucified one. Because Good Friday is such a necessity. It was necessary that God should send his son to die on the cross for you and for me. It was necessary, and it still is necessary. But we continue, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, to preach Christ crucified. He is, and he will always be the crucified one. And we can't lose sight of that. We must never uh, dull down Jesus. We must never dilute Jesus to the point that he's just a moral teacher or that he's just uh, a hero. Jesus is the one who goes to the cross. And Jesus is the one who is risen. He is the one who is resurrected from the grave. He is the one who has beaten down death, Satan, and the power of this dark world. Such that now he stands in victory. He stands before us in victory to say, See, I have opened the tomb. I have opened the grave. And death, that last enemy, its days are numbered. That's why, dear friends, when we look at this image, when we look at this painting, if you will, of Jesus and his disciples, we do well to pay attention first and foremost to the scarred hands and feet of Jesus. 
then our eyes begin to wander. Then we begin to expand our gaze and we can see that Jesus is not only showing them his hands and his feet, while they are disbelieving for joy. You ever disbelieved something for joy? You can't believe that it can be this good. And yet Jesus continued to show them around. Have you anything here to eat? And look over there just in the corner. There is food. There's a, there's a little bit of broiled fish. And Jesus takes it and eats it. A further proof that it is he himself, that he has flesh and bones. It is further proof that, that he is tangible, that he is touchable, that he is right here in front of them, indeed in front of us. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, it must be fulfilled. And so he opens their minds to understand the scriptures. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being one of the 11 there that day? There with Jesus, having been wished peace, having been given to see and to gaze upon the wounds of Christ by which our sins have been taken away. And then probably the best part, at least in my imagination, is that Jesus opens their minds to understand every single prophecy and promise, every single point of the Old Testament scriptures and how they all point to him. It makes me a little jealous of those disciples. I want to be in the upper room. I want to hear those words of Jesus as he opens their minds and gives them his spirit. Thus it is written. This is what the Old Testament says, Jesus says. The Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. Repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And then Jesus says to his disciples and also to us, you are witnesses of these things. You have seen this. You have seen this image. And now behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. Stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So already, even in the third Sunday of Easter, we have this little whispering of what is to come. We have this whispering of the fact that Pentecost is not far off. That beautiful day when the church celebrates its very first birthday, when the church is inaugurated at the preaching of Peter. I've often marveled that it's not so much a miracle that the disciples are able to speak in different languages. I mean, that is a miracle. But I think the greatest miracle of Pentecost is that Peter preaches at all. That a man who had denied his Savior three times, a man who was an untrained fisherman, a man who was not well educated for anyone's imagination, that he stood up in front of priests and Levites and scribes, in front of Pharisees and in front of people from every country named under earth. And he preached Jesus Christ, the crucified one, the risen one. Dear friends in Christ, I, I was looking through this text over the last couple of weeks and it is very similar to John 20. It is almost just sort of, let's hear from Luke what he heard happened in the upper room. But I think it's important for us to hear it from different perspectives. I think it's important for us to hear these details. Because our tendency all too often is that we hear the word of God and we, we hear the first couple of words. Jesus is saying peace to the disciples on Easter. And we think, I know the rest of that one. I've seen that painting before. Can you imagine seeing the Mona Lisa and thinking, I saw that on the internet once. I don't need to pay much attention. Can you imagine seeing Starry Night and saying, I've got a mouse pad at home that looks like that. No need to give it any special attention. But when you actually see the words of God, when you actually see those written by the disciples... Well, dear friends, we do well to stop. We do well to read the painting. We do well to not let any single detail slip past us. We do well to see Jesus. And that's what Jesus would have us to do in this text. See my hands and my feet that it is I myself. Touch me and see for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And dear friends in Christ, we are welcomed this day 
the very table of our Lord that we might see and believe, that we might taste and see that the Lord is good, that we might receive his body and his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. One final thought. Today is the 500th anniversary of the Diet of Worms. When Martin Luther stood up, and perhaps you've seen, there's a very famous painting of Luther standing up and pointing to the word of God and to his catechisms, standing before a church council. You see, today is the 500th anniversary of those, those here I stand moments. Jesus stands before his disciples and says, peace to you. About 1,500 years later, Martin Luther stands and says, here I stand, I can do no other unless I am convinced by the words of God, by my own conscience that I am in error, I cannot and I will not recant. Fast forward 500 years to us. Still standing on the same word of God, still bound by our consciences to that word. My last Words to you this day are a word of admonition and a word of encouragement. Because we live in a world in the midst of a society and perhaps at times even in families that are hostile to the gospel, that want nothing to do with the word of Jesus. And so we get to stand firm, trusting that Jesus has stood firm, that Jesus did not uh, let his resolve slip, but nevertheless he went to the cross on our behalf And his spirit that he gives to us, his spirit that he promises to us, as he makes us witnesses of these things to proclaim to the ends of the earth, his spirit helps us to stand firm. So dear friends in Christ, stand. Dear friends in Christ, take your stand. Trust in Jesus, and he'll take care of the rest. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.